Aloha. When I was 15 years old, my mother died of a sudden, massive coronary occlusion. I learned at an early age that we don't have as much time as we think to do the things we say we want to do. My dad became my mother and father, my best friend, my mentor. We did everything together. We went to the movies together. We bicycled together. We traveled together. We learned how to move on together. And eventually, happily, he met a wonderful woman, got remarried, moved to Florida, and started a new life. But some lessons stay with you, no matter how much your life adjusts. And some changes become permanent. My dad, probably in part because of my mom's death, never really cared that much when people told him what they wanted to do. I want to be a better husband. I want to change the world. I want to make money. I want to write a book. It didn't matter. There wasn't enough time for that. My dad always taught me that our priorities are exhibited not by what we say they are, but by how we spend our limited time. Simple example. I say that my priority is I want to finish writing my novel. And at the end of a long day at work, I go home and I kick back and I unwind and I watch TV for a couple of hours. <laughs> Which is fine and it's totally understandable. But it also means that my actual priority is watching television because that's how I'm spending my time. And it's not a value statement, it's not a judgment, it's just a fact. Now, a little bit over a year ago, like Forrest, I joined the Amidiar Fellows Program. And I took a learning excursion as well. And my excursion was designed to meet two learning goals. The first was to challenge my worldview, which is that people are generally good and will do the right thing. My second one's a little bit embarrassing, um, but since it's just us here tonight, I will tell you, uh, don't spread it around, um, which is that I was going to build my self-confidence. I have something called the imposter complex, which is that no matter what I might achieve, uh, no matter what job I might get, uh, I think I got lucky. I discount it, and I figure out that whenever the people who hired me find out that I'm a complete fraud, I'll be shown the door. And I think that's self-limiting, and I wanted to try to overcome it. So, <laughs> yeah, right? So I went on this trip, and the idea was if I came back, I wanted to be able to say, well, if I did that, then I can do anything. So I went on a solo three-week worldwide excursion from Honolulu to Poland, specifically Auschwitz, Rwanda, the site of the 1994 genocide, and Vietnam, specifically My Lai, site of the massacre in 1968. I wanted to go to places that exhibited extreme inhumanity and find out how it happened, why nobody stopped it, and how people got over it. Um, as some other people in the program mentioned, they described it as my world evil tour. Um, the uh, first stop on my world evil tour was Auschwitz, where over one million people were killed in the Holocaust during World War II. Now, it's a little bit unsettling that sometimes such horrible things can happen in beautiful places. The forest outside Birkenau, the part of Auschwitz where most of the death camps were located, is peaceful. And it's got a vast grove of birch trees. The day I was there, birdsong punctuated the air. But just yards from there, no longer than from where I'm standing to the back of the room, were the bombed out remains of gas chambers, where hundreds of thousands of my people died, taking 20 minutes to suffocate. Now, I think in large part because my first stop was Auschwitz, I spent a lot of time before the trip, during the trip, and after the trip, I just got back about a month and a half ago, uh, talking to my dad about it. My dad was born in Brooklyn in 1940. And as a Jewish kid being raised in New York City in the late 40s and early 50s, he knew a lot of Holocaust survivors. They ran the shops in his neighborhood. He got to see the tattoos on their arms from the camps. And then he went to college and he studied the Holocaust. And he went to NYU for grad school. And while he was there, he spent a number of weeks reading all of the transcripts from the Nuremberg tribunals. And he told me that during that time, he cried himself to sleep every night. He later went on to become a professor in his own right, teaching philosophy and logic and ethics. And then at his own university, created a Holocaust workshop, which went on to win national recognition based on his own original research interviewing survivors and liberators. And when I got old enough, I got the chance to actually help him put that together a little bit. So it seemed kind of fitting that when I was sitting in my hotel room in Poland, 
FaceTiming with my dad on my iPad. I was doing it literally across the street from the gates to Auschwitz. Now, walking around Birkenau and Auschwitz is eerie. It's unsettling and it's, it's powerful. And I was expecting that. What I wasn't expecting was going to Auschwitz and meeting a survivor whose message was one of forgiveness. A woman named Eva Moses Kor. She was 11 years old when she arrived at Auschwitz with her twin sister. And twins were a particular fascination of Dr. Joseph Mengele, also known as the Nazi angel of death. And Eva and her sister were tortured by Dr. Joseph Mengele as part of his medical experiments. Now despite that torture, Eva has forgiven Mengele and Hitler and the Nazis for what they did. She doesn't condone them, she does not release them for what they've done, but she feels that if she wants to live with her personal freedom, there is no better way for her to live free than through her forgiveness. That's what she told me. She also told me that she's not going to wait for Mengele and Hitler and the Nazis to repent before she lives with the freedom that she deserves. And she had written to the parents of the victims at Sandy Hook Elementary School to share her story and tell them that there is always hope after disaster and there is always a tomorrow after despair. She is living her priorities. Her priority is to live with personal freedom and she's doing that through her forgiveness. In 1994, Genocide came to the tiny East African nation of Rwanda. Now, historically, Rwanda was a largely peaceful nation, but after decades of colonial rule, a rift had developed between the Hutus and the Tutsis. Now, when you go to Rwanda today, it's kind of taboo to refer to those two groups. People try to refer to themselves solely as Rwandans. But in 1994, that rift exploded as Hutu extremists sought to eradicate the Tutsis. In just 90 days, over one million people were killed. They were killed with guns and grenades and clubs and machetes. Machetes that were shipped into the country in bulk specifically for this purpose. Neighbors killed neighbors, husbands killed wives, principals killed teachers, doctors killed patients, priests killed their parishioners. The genocidaires, as they were called, planned the genocide for maximum culpability. They wanted to make sure that everyone literally had blood on their hands. Now I want you to imagine this. You leave this TED Talk tonight, you go home, you park, you walk into your house, you come into your kitchen and you see blood on the floor. And then you find the slaughtered remains of your family. And when you look in their faces, you know that their last moments were spent in pain and fear. And you know that your next door neighbor the one whose 16 year old daughter babysits your kids, he's the one who did it. That's what people faced all across Rwanda and they had to find a way to deal with it if they were gonna move on. So they created a system called the Gachaka system. G-A-C-A-C-A. -A -A. I encourage you all to go home and research it. It's amazing. There have been a lot of books and articles written about it, so I'm not gonna go into those details. What I'm gonna do is tell you the story of one man named Paul who was affected by it. Paul was my guide at the Genocide Memorial at Morambi. Now, Morambi, like Birkenau, is beautiful. There are endless rolling hills in every direction, and the day I was there, there was a summer breeze that just made you think of picnics and strolls. And yet, in one day, 50,000 people were massacred there. And over 1,000 preserved bodies are on display at Morambi as a grisly reminder of what we are capable of doing to each other. And the smell of those preserved bodies is sickly sweet, and it was stuck in my nostrils for hours after I left. Paul is from a town called Nyamata, which was another massacre site, and he saw his father shot in front of him. He barely escaped, and later found out that his mother and his siblings had also been killed. He escaped to the wetlands, survived there for a couple of weeks, and then went to the hills. And by the time he came back, when the killing was over, they had found the man who killed his family. And under the Kachaka system, he was tried, and he was sentenced to six years in prison. And so I asked Paul, what do you think about this? What do you think about the guy who killed your family only going to jail for six years? And he told me a story that when the guy came out of prison, he found Paul, 
and he apologized for killing his family, told him where they were buried so that they could be exhumed and given a proper rest. And he told me that he found the man to be courageous. He found the man who killed his family to be courageous. And so I asked him, do you still know where he is? And he told me not only does he know where he lives, he has his phone number, and they stay in touch. Paul's priority in life is moving forward. And this is the only way he can do it, because he lives in the same area as this man, and they're going to have to get along. And Paul's not alone. This is a story that's repeated all across the country, so much so that other African nations have sent official delegations to Rwanda to try to find out how to create unity and reconciliation after disaster and move <coughs> forward. On March 16, 1968, a group of American soldiers massacred hundreds of Vietnamese civilians. Charlie Company, an American unit, entered the town of My Lai in South Vietnam with intelligence which proved to be incredibly wrong that enemy soldiers were stationed there. And after a few hours, they had killed 300 civilians, men and women, Keiki and Kapuna. And only one soldier was ever convicted for what happened there, Lieutenant William Calley, the leader of Charlie Company. And his sentence was later commuted by President Nixon. Now, the day I was in My Lai, it was beautiful, it was tranquil, it looked like something out of an oil painting. And the tall grasses swayed in this just hypnotic fashion. And yet, 45 years before I showed up, people survived that massacre by hiding under dead bodies, pretending to be dead themselves, and listening to the screams of their neighbors as they were raped and shot. Now, I spent two days in Milai interviewing survivors, four survivors. And they all told me something very similar which was the day that that had happened, if they could have, they would have killed the members of Charlie Company themselves. They would have done that a week later, a month later, even a year later. But they told me that decades have passed. Our nations are at peace. And they would welcome them back as friends now. And so I pushed a little bit. And I said, well, tell me, if a guy from Charlie Company walked into your village right now, what would you say to him? And they told me, if he confessed and apologized, I would forgive him. I didn't ask them about forgiveness. They brought it up on their own. And yet, that wasn't the story that stuck with me the most from Eli. There was a woman I met, one of the survivors, we'll call her On. Like so many of her fellow villagers, she, she survived by hiding under dead bodies and pretending to be dead herself. And while she was lying there, she saw her father walking. And she wanted to call out to him and tell him to lie down so he wouldn't get hurt, but she couldn't without giving herself up. And so she had to sit there and watch him be killed, silently. After seven or eight hours of lying there, she finally got up. She was wounded herself. And so she went to another village to try to get medical care. And I asked her, how long was it before you came back to Milai? And she told me, only one or two days. So I asked her, how could you come back so soon? And she told me it was because she had to harvest the rice, because it was all they had to eat. Now, the day I was in Milai, the two days, interviewing people, I was in a comfortable room with ceiling fans circling overhead. And yet, the flies would not leave us alone. They were just constantly annoying. So imagine then being on, coming back to Milai, the bodies of your friends and neighbors and family and your pets and your cattle have been roasting in the sun for two days. Most of your homes have been burned down. A lot of your crops have been destroyed. And in the middle of that hell, you want to survive and ensure the survival of your fellow villagers. So you stand up, pick up your tools, and start harvesting rice, surrounded by death. I traveled around the world trying to become a better person and hopefully a better leader. And while I still have the imposter complex, <laughs> uh, even I can't deny that I did accomplish a remarkable journey. And I absolutely challenged my view of the world. But for every evil I encountered, I found stories of hope and forgiveness and perseverance. Eva in Auschwitz, Paul in Rwanda, An in Vietnam showed me truly courageous leadership. They showed me how to turn pain into compassion and grief 
into empathy and adversity into determination. They didn't pretend that the horrors they endured didn't occur. They used it to feed their own recovery. They took what could have been their moments of greatest weakness, and some people would see it that way, and turned it in to their finest strength, setting an example for all of us. Now, I was thinking about this a lot as I came back from my trip, and when I landed in Honolulu just a little bit over a month ago, and I was still thinking about it when I left for another trip just about 10 days later in Atlanta. I had to go to a business conference, thinking about how do I align my priorities with my actions? How do I actually put into practice these incredible lessons that I've learned. And I talked to my dad about it a lot on the phone, um, and talked to him actually about the story of An harvesting rice. And I think that he was just as struck by that as I was. Then about two days into my Atlanta trip, coincidentally exactly one month ago today, my dad went for a 20 mile bike ride in his quiet neighborhood in Florida, which is something he did pretty much Every single, every single day of his life. And then about a mile from his house, my dad, my role model, my conscience, was killed instantly in an accident with a large construction truck. I flew down to Florida, and I spent the next week and a half there with his wife making final arrangements. And when I came back to Honolulu, I was carrying the cremated remains of my mother and my father, and I was also bringing back his bicycle, which somehow was not even damaged in the accident. I can't believe my dad's dead. And the only reason I can talk to you about this right now without completely breaking down is because I know that in a very real sense, I'm pretending he's not, and that I'm not an orphan. Eva had told me in Auschwitz that there is always hope after disaster, that there is always a tomorrow after despair. I have to believe that. And I will tell you right now that my priority is living my life like there is no tomorrow, because I know how true that can be. But I also cannot deny the pain and the grief that I'm feeling right now. I have to accept my sorrow, and my hope is that I can draw, as Paul and Eva and Ann did, hope and courage and confidence from my own endurance. So the challenge I have here is this. Not everybody, fortunately, is orphaned in their 30s, and thank God most of us have never had to endure a genocide or a massacre, but every one of you here tonight has gone through some pain, some grief, some moment in your life when you were laid low and felt weak and beaten. And my challenge to you is don't forget that. Don't push that aside. Don't try to pretend it didn't happen. Accept it. Pull it into you because those moments are the moments when you are most human. And we are strongest when we embrace our humanity and show others that it is okay to do that. That's when we're at our best. Now, if my dad is watching us here tonight, and dad, I pray that you are, I think he would tell me that it doesn't really matter right now what I tell you. What matters is what I do. And I think he would want me to get back to work and start harvesting some rice for both of us. Thank you.